Good morning, everybody. We, we will start this, this session about uh, uh, real -time impro improving real-time mobility information for commuters. We got, I have the, the, the honor, I'm, I'm uh, Enrique Cañas from TMB, the main operator of public transport in, in the city of Barcelona. Uh, I will um, um, take the opportunity to say th uh, thank you for coming on Barcelona on behalf of the um, City Council that is mine of my owner. I will, uh, uh, I hope you have uh, a nice stay in the city and take all the, all the, all the opportunities and the hospitality of, of the operator and from the part of mobility that is my responsibility. So I, I will make a very brief uh, introduction because uh, I think the most interesting thing is to uh, listen to the different um, sessions and cases that will be presented later. But uh, as a uh, uh, reminder of, of, of our, um, of our uh, experience, I, I remember 20 years ago, we do a survey about uh, public transport information. And, and we realized that in that case, 30% 30, 30 of people don't do the, 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 the trip in public transport for the lack of, of knowledge that it can be done in public transport. Eh? 20, 20 years later, I, we, we are uh, entering in a new, in a new uh, absolutely uh, area about this because we can uh, have the, the technology and the possibility to give our citizens uh, real-time information in pre-trip, uh, in-trip, and post-trip. And that's uh, for, for us, is, uh, and for the point of view for an, of an operator, like this in, in my case, is a, a really, really like a challenge, very challenged uh, place, because everything changes when you have uh, um, an, a good information, we can balance, we can uh, promote, uh, we can control mobility, we can do, all things that are, we are going to present in four um, for, um, um, for um, uh, moderators. F first, first of, of them, it would be uh, from from the city of Am Amsterdam, Peter Legends. I want to thank you uh, your contribution. Uh, Pete, Peter is a, a Dutch politician in the uh, in People's Party from Freedom Democracy. Peter is a deputy mayor. So from the city of Amsterdam, I will introduce a uh, very uh, good initiative and innovation in, plan, in, in planning in transport and, and places. Please, you can come yeah. and, and speak. So, use. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be in Barcelona. It's a pleasure to be, well, especially coming from Amsterdam, pleasure to be in a city with 11 months of sunshine a year as I was told uh, yesterday, and that's completely different uh, than where, well, where we come from. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I, I will be telling some things about Amsterdam, but what, when it comes to Amsterdam, um, uh, the problems and challenges are quite similar in a lot of European cities uh, and all, cities all over the world. Um, Amsterdam is, is, is a vastly growing city. This is uh, uh, the future, still the future, but it's near future. And uh, what we see in Amsterdam is that every year we welcome 120 new foreign companies a year. We will be building 100,000 new apartments in Amsterdam, in the city of Amsterdam, uh, from now until uh, 2025, which will mean 200,000 new Amsterdammers. Our city will be growing from 840,000 inhabitants to more over than a million inhabitants in only uh, 10, 15 years. And 17 million visitors, tourists, come to Amsterdam each year. And I know that Barcelona is a city with a lot of tourists, but also Amsterdam is a city with a lot of tourists. And um, in addition to that growth, we see some other uh, developments. We see that the, the average household becomes smaller in Amsterdam. It's not only in Amsterdam, it's in a lot of cities. Uh, more people are highly educated in the city. And between 2006, 2010 and 16, uh, the number of self-employed people increased by 60% to uh, 61,000. And what we see is that our city is being used more intensively than it has been used ever before. Um, and in addition to this, 
an increasing number of people are living outside of Amsterdam, working in Amsterdam. Right today, we have about 280,000 cars driving into Amsterdam each day. Within 15 years, that will become 450,000 cars each day. Those numbers are massive. You know? One of our biggest challenges, the main challenge, is how to keep Amsterdam attractive, accessible, and livable. And like many other old cities, well, old cities, Amsterdam isn't that old, uh, Amsterdam has a medieval core. You see it there, Amsterdam is famous, world famous for its canals. Um, and unlike Paris or London or some other major cities, Amsterdam did not implement in the last decades a large-scale urban renewal. Uh, in, in the 19th century. Only a modest ring, a, a car ring, with uh, relative, relatively narrow streets was added to the city. And that means that the challenges um, that we face uh, is not how to make more infrastructure, but how to use the public, well, the square meters of public space we have. We cannot add uh, extra infrastructure, so we have to find other solutions. And what we see is that Amsterdam is a, a city that is famous for its bikes. Um, car lanes are increasingly congested, but also bicycle lanes get more and more crowded every day. Uh, and furthermore, the city is growing within its boundaries. Uh, we do not build new houses in green areas or in blue areas. We build it in the uh, current city boundaries. And therefore, public space becomes increasingly uh, scarce. And in recent years, the city has taken some measures measures to reduce the number of cars in Amsterdam um, in certain spots in the city center. And we have taken measures to make the city even safer, safer uh, for cyclists, for pedestrians. We invested in a new metro line, which took us uh, much, much longer than we expected. We started with a budget from 1.3 billion euros, and right now we're on 3.1 billion euros. But it will be open next year, at the 22nd of July, at 5 o'clock in the morning. But Despite those measures, in the long run, uh, another approach, a more fundamental change in our approach to mobility is needed. And I think that goes for a lot of other cities. And I think the approach will be mobility as a service. We believe that mobility as a service is that new approach. And it makes three fundamentally different shifts in the approach to mobility, mobility as a service. First, the shift from ownership to usage. Uh, in the mobility as a service approach, few people need to own their own cars for even, or even bicycles. Um, and especially in cities, a new generation of drivers, the new generation uh, uh, is not very keen on uh, owning their own cars. Second, um, there has to be a shift from supply to demand driven. Uh, right now, we offer public transport. We offer public transport, and it's not uh, uh, demand driven, it's, it's supply driven. So what we do is offer bus lines uh, even when there are no, well, not a lot of passengers. And we will dramatically have to make a change to a supply-driven uh, mode of transport. Um, personal preferences of people, uh, real-time information on traffic situation, budget choices, will, will all be uh, having taken into, in, in, into account when it comes to mobility as a service. Um, citizens will only Am I shutting it down right now? <laughs> yeah. Citizen. Citizen will only accept that new approach when different modes of transportation connect seamlessly. And that's one of the major challenges we face. And that's why we need a third shift, a, sh a third shift from a separated domains between states and markets to one integrated system, one integrated mobility system in which public and private organizations work together, closely together to facilitate the citizens. And traditionally, I already said it, uh, government fund public transport companies for those who don't have a car. And we fund infrastructure for those who have a car. Bicycle lanes are for people to commute within a limited distance. And what we need, and what we need is that policy makes new choices. New choices um, uh, where, we, um, um, where we don't have um, uh, 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 differences between the different modes of transport. In the mobility as a service approach, all domains should be made available to everybody. And investment decisions as well from the government, uh, public or private, will benefit the mobility system as a whole. The fourth shift is this. 
Now digital technology, mobile internet, uh, data are mostly cool or, or extra to the existing infrastructure. And to my opinion, in the future, mobility as a system, service, uh, mobility as a service, the real-time data are the foundation of the mobility architecture. With mobility as a service, we hope to achieve improved quality of life uh, when it comes to the usage of uh, square meters of public space, but also when it comes uh, to uh, 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 pollution, uh, uh, livability of our um, uh, cities, breathing, less congestion, less pollution, monitor and analyze the outcomes. Um, what is to be done? How can we arrive at the mobility utopia? Well, first of all, it is already happening. Uh, there are currently in Amsterdam more than 4,000 uh, uh, car-sharing cars in Amsterdam, um, which is an increase of 600% uh, from 2008. But still, 4,000 car-sharing cars is only 2% of the total amount of cars. Secondly, we're not afraid to learn from our mistakes, and that's why we experiment and we initiate uh, pilot projects. We are currently preparing a pilot project in Amsterdam in the central business district, uh, Zuidas, which is our financial district. Um, uh, this central district is, is rapidly growing, and it's on the south side of Amsterdam. And currently, more than 40,000 people go to work in that area, that particular area. Major international, national banks, law offices, business consultants, European headquarters are located there. And currently, 40% of those people working there uh, use their private car to come to work. And larger firms at the Zuidas have already pledged they want to work with the city, together with the city, um, to promote mobility as a service to bring that number down. And in a pilot project, uh, people are uh, given an incentive to use mass services instead of a car. And we already started with 50 persons who handed in their private car key to us. And in return, we gave them a budget of 1,000 euros, mobility budget, and they could use it uh, uh, in each way, well, uh, 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 every way they liked, on mobility, on mobility. They can uh, use uh, a, sh a shared car, um, uh, a shared bike system, uh, they, could, uh, they, they can rent cars, they can uh, use public uh, transport, and right now we're evaluating uh, that approach. And um, uh, what we are going to do is expand it to 500 users, and we are planning to scale up in a, in a matter of a few years up to 10,000 people in 2020. Uh, we embrace public-private partnerships, and that's why I am here. And to, I'm here to invite cutting-edge technology firms to help us. And that's what I would like to do. It's a cry for help. Um, uh, we as governments are not the front runners. The front runners are you, uh, private companies, innovative companies who invest, who, in, who, who, uh, who innovate. And what we are uh, doing right now is trying to cooperate, to build networks with you. And I would like to invite you to come to the Holland Pavilion, to the Holland Pavilion at 1600 hours, 1700 hours. Um, and get into contact there and help us to find a solution for the mobility, system, the mobility challenge we face in Amsterdam and a lot of international cities face all around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly so just in time minutes. delivery. I know. <laughs> just in time delivery. Thank you very much. So I, I will um, um, ask to Miguel to introduce in the Miguel Cabeza to the IT uh, solutions uh, and could you please uh, tell us? I will uh, remember to the audience that we have an, uh, an app to make the asks uh, for the presentations, and I need the table too to, to turn the asks. So uh, uh, there is two ways for the ask questions. One is just in the in the microphones on doing or using the app to uh, instant uh, send the answers to to us. Eh? Thank you, and you, it's your turn, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thanks to all the attendants to this session. Uh, my name is Miguel Cabeza. I'm a senior pre sales and technical manager uh, of Dahua Iberia. And we're going to talk in this session about uh, technology. Peter was uh, crying for help uh, from technology firms, uh, but, uh, well, not only about technology, but also about the benefits and uh, real success cases. Uh, helping uh, smart cities today. 
So uh, let's review the requirements and uh, the tendency. The amount, uh, the amount of pickles in the world is more than one billion. Uh, this is according to the Transport Forum website and the World Bank. And every year, about uh, 1.2 million people lost uh, their lives in crashes on road. Uh, the road traffic injuries are estimated to cost uh, develop developing countries 5% uh, of the GDP, or more than $1 uh, trillion per year. There are high hopes for ITS solutions. In America, uh, there is a program, a transportation program uh, in development, and the plan is to save lives, uh, 10,000 people per year. Uh, the plan is to reduce traffic accidents. We're talking about uh, 1 million to 200,000 uh, traffic accidents per year. And reduce the loss caused by these traffic jams and these accidents, the material loss, $26 billion. In Japan, there's a, a similar program uh, for ITS uh, running th uh, until uh, 2025. The plan is to reduce uh, traffic accidents by 50%. The average speed to be increased by 10 kilometers per hour to reduce the oil consumption in 25%. And the uh, CO2 emissions, uh, they want to, redu uh, to, to get a reduction in around 15%. In the case of Europe, we are talking about uh, similar figures traffic death accidents uh, uh, down by 50% and reduce the losses caused by the traffic, uh, traffic accidents and congestions and environmental pollution to 555 billion euros. So uh, <clears throat> what we have in the, in the technology landscape uh, today is uh, it's not only hype, uh, it's not only hope, but it's a reality some uh, complex uh, strategy games like chess and Go, which is very popular in, in, uh, throughout Asia, have, uh, have now found uh, that the, the best players are not human beings. The best players are machines. And we are talking about uh, this is not just uh, com combinatorics, this is just not mathematics, this is, uh, we're talking about the strategies. Uh, last year, the best player of Go was defeated by a uh, Google DeepMind machine. And the tendency is to extract, uh, to, to go farther, not only take the data, not only from this data being able to gather information, but also to extract knowledge from this uh, information. So uh, we are talking about having higher rates of recognition and uh, having more, uh, more information about the identity of uh, the vehicles or the passengers of, uh, or the situation, the awareness uh, uh, of, the, um, of the road. So at the front end, we can see we, with this uh, deep learning algorithms, we are able to provide uh, identification and detection of, uh, uh, in the passenger's area of the seat belt, the phone. We are able to identify the brand, the model uh, of the truck or car or vehicle, uh, the motorbike, and even the year of manufacturing. Uh, the plate, of course, which is something not new, but we, thanks to the deep learning, we are able to reach higher rates of recognition with uh, deep learning uh, algorithms. And uh, we can analyze the phase and we can provide information about the traffic flow, the queuing situation, and uh, average speed. This is a real snapshot of a system in place in China. It's a Dahua system. And uh, you can see we, uh, th the system is not uh, only detecting, okay? It's not only providing the data uh, in, in the form of uh, image, 
okay, a cropped image. We, we have information about uh, what the driver is wearing, the plate, uh, if it's, if the, the color of the car, uh, we could get the brand if possible. Uh, and even we can link, the data, this database is linked with insurance um, databases so that we can, uh, uh, we, can uh, we are able to know if uh, there is any vehicle on road with no insurance at all. So uh, in the, this last 10 years, we have moved from uh, being a camera manufacturer. Uh, we are the first uh, private company in the world in terms of revenue, manufacturing cameras and recording systems and uh, 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 global uh, comprehensive security solutions. But uh, we have moved from this uh, approach of uh, uh, all-in-one cameras to, uh, as you can see at the end, uh, deep learning and data structured um, information. In our traffic solution, we, we have electronic police, speed measurement, illegal parking, and traffic guidance. We are able to uh, detect uh, illegal uh, movements by a car made, for example, in an intersection violation. We can detect multiple violations, like uh, running the red light, uh, crossing a solid line, going the, driving the wrong way, and changing in an illegal lane. Uh, sorry, I ran. So this is our solution for uh, uh, the electronic police. And uh, the speed measurement with a fixed solution and a mobile solution and we support multi-target tracking of up to four lanes. We're able to detect, to capture, and uh, intelligent, intelligent, uh, smartly uh, um, positioning the, 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 our cameras towards uh, a vehicle in, a, in a, an area park, uh, who, uh, in an area park uh, with uh, no permission. And this is done automatically, without human intervention. So this is our solution, 200 meters around. We are able to, to manage this. Intelligent, we are able to smartly control the traffic lights, to control the traffic flow. In just one single box, thanks to these deep learning algorithms, traffic flow, queue length, headway, average speed, and the level of occupancy. With our uh, platform, we are able to not only see in real time, and, uh, but to follow a, a specific vehicle and search for those violations. As an example, in, the, in Hangzhou, uh, in the G20 summit, uh, the congestions were reduced 17%, violations were reduced in 50%, and uh, traffic accidents were reduced in 30%. Some references, Serbia, Interpol City. Mongolia in uh, Ulaanbaatar, in the capital, with ANPR, e-police, uh, speed measurement, and uh, high spot PTZ surveillance. Here you can see uh, the system uh, searching for a plate. Mm -hmm. In Poland, with uh, light enforcement, speed enforcement, and integrated management. In Bangkok, in Thailand, with uh, 40 intersections of uh, ANPR systems and uh, e-police in 40 con uh, uh, conjunctions. Uh, this is the system in Thailand, not to mention the systems in place in China. So thank you very much. Just in time too. Now it's the turn for for Jean Myers from Wild Research, who will tell us about their company activities in this. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here in Barcelona. Uh, thank you very much, and great panel as well. Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about Wild Mesh. It's um, it's our emergency and uh, disruption notification system for public transport. 
and it was developed as, <coughs> as, a, uh, as a project for Innovate UK and London Underground in 2015, and more recently we were entering into a pilot with Virgin Trains East Coast um, to deliver this solution. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, there you go. <laughs> okay. Oop. I'm sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, um, in a UK uh, survey, we found that only 26% of passengers are feeling that they get the, the correct information or enough information during disruptions. And that solution or that situation is even, uh, is even greater for staff. The staff feel that they don't have enough information to give the passengers the correct information. And as many of you know that are involved in rail, that um, passenger information disrupt during disruptions is paramount to being able to um, make that experience better for the passengers uh, in the event of disruptions. And combined with this, uh, there's a rise, obviously, in natural disasters in the last 10 years, in terrorist incidents, and in cyber warfare. Now, to combine, to complicate that even more, um, you, you may have heard from there, in, by 2020, there'll be between 20 and 34 billion devices. And that, that means there'd be about four devices per person. So we're coming into a situation where the networks are, um, the networks are gonna be stretched, the transportation networks are gonna be stretched, and there's more and more people in, the, in, the, in urban areas. And the situation with, with the device networks is such that even the 5G specification calls for device-to-device -device networks as a way to densify the networks in order to accommodate this large number of devices. Um, <clears throat> and so our solution, the Emergency and Disruption E-Alert Network, um, is, is our solution to solve this. And it's, it's based on a real-time feed, real-time streaming feed, combined with a mesh network. Um, to deliver um, contextually relevant information, which is quite important, that, and that is actionable. In other words, if, if a passenger is unable to uh, complete their journey due to a cancel cancellation or delay, um, they need to have other travel options. So our feed, um, our real-time stream notifications actually update a, an offline journey planner on our solution. So I'm gonna, in case you're not really familiar with what mesh networks are, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of that. So traditional networks, star networks, on the left-hand side, um, you may recognize those as, for instance, how a router sits at the center or a PC. Um, and those are great, they have a central authority that's really great for security, but it's also a single point of failure. And a mesh network where devices, smartphones, can connect directly to each other, certainly eliminates that problem, but then again has the the issue of, of authority and, and authentication. And a hybrid network combines the best of both worlds. So it's, it's online, uh, it's on the mesh continuously, and then when there is internet connectivity, that connects. And that's effectively what our, our streaming, the wild mesh solution is with our uh, real-time stream. Now, what we've done with London Underground during the, during the trial, uh, we found that actually, uh, we actually help move the data through the system. So for instance, as a user or passenger enters the station, he's got cellular data and he has the most recent information on his phone. And as he enters the, the London Underground or any of the network, um, that he may or may not have connectivity in the, in the forequarter in the platform Wi-Fi. And as he gets down into the system and the, net, the mesh connects, anyone with information, just one person on a platform can update and then spread that information very quickly throughout the rest of the network. Our latency is effectively the longest time it takes for a train to get between two platforms. So we ran these tests on the London Underground. Uh, we ran five technical tests between May and April uh, 2016. And we had two massive learnings from that. Now when people talk about mesh solutions, they often tell you that um, one of, the, one of the benefits is self-healing. Well, that's not only a benefit, but that's a, a metric that you can measure how good a mesh network is. And we actually ran into quite a bit of interference, as you would expect, on the underground, electric cars. And in fact, the carriages themselves are Faraday cages. They, they keep signals out. So 
what we found is that on the underground, we were having a lot of drop signals. <clears throat> so we had to make our solution even more robust. But the interesting thing that we found is that um, compared to Wi-Fi, we were getting connection speeds two to six times faster uh, than, than Wi-Fi, depending on the contention. So in really busy, in really busy um, stations, it sometimes would take between 36, 30 seconds and a minute to connect on Wi-Fi, where mesh is pretty consistently 10 seconds. So even where you have connectivity, mesh will deliver that information faster. And, and in some situations, we found that even before the train stopped, the, the signal was coming through, the information was coming through on mesh. So to address the challenge, we built a solution that has three main components. We have a mobile SDK, and for Virgin, as a matter of fact, we're building a staff app on top of that to, to as I said, to inform the staff about disruption so that they can properly relate that to, uh, relay that to the, the passengers. Um, so this SDK can be integrated into existing systems or it can be uh, used to build new greenfield projects. And then we have a cloud gateway. Now that's effectively how we get the, the data from the cloud or from the open data services or in, in Virgin's case from their rail operating center into the mesh. So we digitally sign everything as it gets onto the mesh so that we know that it's from an authenticated source and push, and push it down over a live stream and, uh, and that cloud gateway acts as that signing service. And it also uh, contains a content management system for collecting, curating, and distributing, managing the uh, passengers of passenger information or the disruption information from rail operating control. And we're looking at uh, putting a solution in into York to, to prototype this for Virgin. So uh, again, to reiterate the the, the real advantage of our solution, while there's a lot of intelligence and some really innovative things we're doing with the content management system, it's really the, the mesh is our USP and it provides sustainable data distribution in the event of internet outages, power failures, terrorist incidents, natural disasters, and cyber warfare. And in conclusion, we know that you know, emergency uh, scenarios are on the rise. Uh, by about 40, 50 percent over the last decade. Uh, there's going to be anywhere from 20 to 34 billion devices by 2020, depending on who you, who you uh, get that information from. And that device to device and mesh networking is important, not only for emergency sc scenarios, but again, also for, um, also for densifying the networks. The, even the 5G networks are going to uh, strain to cope under this load. So you can go to our site. We actually, uh, next week, we'll have the case, the full case study from London Underground available. Um, so please go to, go, you can go download it now and we'll, we'll send it to you when, it's, when it is available. Um, happy to you know, answer any questions if you want to email us and ask us more about that. And then, of course, if you sign up, then as soon as we finish the Virgin uh, project, that, that, avail that case study will be available as well. And really, that, that's all we have. I finished early, so we saved no, the time. It's, it's Thank you very much. It's on time, Jean. Thank you. Thank you for your for your it's very amazing. And last uh, from uh, Digital Telecom European Smart Solution, uh, please, Miklos, introduce us uh, in deep about uh, mobility as a service provider. So that's your turn. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, it's uh, really easy to continue this, uh, this line of presentations because all my colleagues um, before me, they all introduce you into this ecosystem. And actually, uh, mobility as a service being referred earlier. Uh, so what I would like to do is just keep continue, go into a bit details, and probably trigger some questions from your side and from other sides as well. So let's jump in. Uh, so what we are going to talk about is, again, uh, showing you what mobility as a service is, then uh, facing with the challenge which we have, at least in Budapest, then um, just uh, get to know about the ecosystem of uh, mobility as a service, see and list the prerequisites of such a thing, then uh, get to know the stakeholders, and see what are the action points, maybe you have some more. Okay, so why we have Netflix here? 
Spotify. You have Spotify, yeah? Yeah, you, you're listening uh, music on Spotify, probably. You're watching on HBO Go movies, right? Game of Thrones, stuff like that. Have you ever bought in the last two years pro DVD or uh, a CD from your favorite band, probably, because you would like to keep it on your shelf? But usually, you are doing it on the go, and you are using these services from the cloud. You are not owning things anymore. You are streaming it. So let's just interpret this into mobility. Do you really need your car? Don't you afraid that it's going to be scratched? Someone is going to steal it. Or uh, even you just don't want to invest such a huge money into owning something, which is going to be outdated soon. Uh, maybe if it's a Tesla, then yeah. But then let's go. I would say that mobility as a service uh, is the same business model which we all know from the streaming uh, services. Because uh, mobility as a service is user-centric. So it's focusing on you uh, as a traveler. And um, then we will see that all the other stakeholders are also interested in this. Um, because the intelligent mobility distribution mobile, uh, model, it's, uh, it's aggregating, integrating all the service modes which are available. So how I got here? Uh, actually, I look out from my window, and then I realize that there's going to be a huge traffic jam. So I opened Google Maps, and uh, then I figured that, OK, so probably the best way to come here, taking the subway or by a cab. And I could make this decision because the city somehow achieved that the cab and the public transportation is all included into Google Maps. It's not the case in Budapest. We hope it's going to reach this status. So, and uh, I think one really important point that, mm, at least in Budapest, many and most of the taxpayers' money is being invested into new subway lines. You know how much money it is? It's a lot. And then it's just one mode of transportation. So what I say that we already have capacities which should be better used. And this business model makes it happen. Uh, so what's the challenge? Maximizing uh, the utility of the existing uh, capacities and changing the mind to a holistic uh, view. So we are taking into, uh, into account all modes of transportation. And uh, um, the very basic is to uh, the fundament of this, uh, distributing real-time information to the, uh, to the passengers. So see. Let's see that, uh, what's the ecosystem. On the top, you can see uh, mobility as a service and its, uh, let's say, existence on your phone, like the Spotify application. So you are having this. Uh, you can do all the functionalities uh, through this application. Then there are the providers. You all know bike sharing. Here you have bike sharing as well if you're local. Uh, you have peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. You have ride sharing, ride hailing. All this stuff. Of course, you have the public transportation companies. Uh, but these are all providers which are providing the service through one mobility operator to you as the passenger or as the person who would like to go from A to B. And uh, since we've been asked, or we've been, let's say, uh, asked that where are the technology enablers, um, here we are. So, like, um, you just mentioned you have many stuff which can be implemented. As Deutsche Telekom also have, focusing on this, uh, we also have all, the, all this, uh, let's say, knowledge and also the, the delivery capacity to do this. Because urban development is one of the fundament. Then the traf uh, traffic developments, building roads, the public transportation railways and all the infrastructure. And of course, the, the connectivity, uh, which uh, can, um, help you using your smartphone anywhere. Um, yeah, so the smartphones all of you almost have, I guess. The seamless payment, because it's OK that I can choose uh, which I would like to use, but then I would like to pay as fast as and, and as seamless as possible. And let's see the stakeholders. The, the technology enablers, we are already here. And uh, Let's focus on the IT integrators, which have the knowledge, and they are ready to serve this ecosystem. Uh, one really good example, I think, uh, the 
the WIM application. It's from Helsinki. Uh, it's already uh, an, an existing uh, application which aggregates all these modes of transportation. So being, being in Helsinki, uh, you can decide whether I would like to go by cab, use the public transportation by bike, or the combination of this. That's really important. Uh, the mobility service uh, providers, they are competing to each other, so you're gonna get better service, hopefully. Uh, and uh, as the local authorities and political actors, they have, let's say, um, the responsibility to trigger this and do not block the innovation. Uh, the customers, this is, I think, the easiest thing what we can imagine. So, uh, yeah, I'm someone who is coming from the suburbs, would like to go into the city, and I would like to make the best decision. I'm so tired paying so much money for something which is not convenient. It just, i rather go with car. So that's the way which is about to change. And I think this is what happened in Amsterdam with these 50 people, and uh, I really hope that in a few years, there won't be company cars because company-owned cars will be neglected. And probably this kind of fleet is going to be serve all, these, um, all the employees and the city will be able to breath again. Um, yeah, so again, using a really simple payment method. And let's see that who are these. So the relation, I think uh, po uh, political and uh, so the policy has to enable all the others uh, to be able to act. Otherwise, it's gonna be blocked from the very first point. The business, so there has to be business in this uh, model. Otherwise, no one is gonna invest in this new model of transportation. The technology, I would say it's already here. Uh, you just have to choose the best provider and uh, hopefully Deutsche Telekom will stand in the game. So customers, yeah, here we are. I'm happy and you are happy to pay for the less money for the best service available. And uh, let's see what's the action points because uh, the city governments should buy in. What does it mean? They have to make some steps towards to make this happen and they have to enable uh, the actors to make this happen uh, and let private companies into the game. Um, and this is where we are, public-private partnership. Um, there are good models, how they could implement it uh, in countries. Um, in Budapest, we see good and bad examples, but these private companies are eager to make money. So they will offer the best service for the city and for the customers. So I believe that there is a good match. And uh, so the technology architecture, um, it should be something where I can easily connect. So it, it shouldn't be something close. Okay, if I have a good service, uh, I believe I can take you from A to B, but I don't have access to, um, to supply my services. Uh, that's bad. You have to open the market for all the providers and, as the, and, and then the city won't invest so much money on, into something which is already in the market. And uh, yeah, since we are supposed to talk about the commuters or someone who is living in the suburb, so yeah, take into consideration not just the city travel, uh, so not just within the capitals and the big cities, but also all the people who are coming to Amsterdam, 100,000 people buy cars, they should leave their car at home because these applications, these platforms should be open for them as well. And let's see where we are in Budapest. Budapest, as I said, uh, we already implemented many of the solutions which are supporting mobility as a service. Um, we are at the stage where we are providing real-time mobility information, passenger information, um, but there are no private companies. And we as Deutsche Telekom providing all these solutions to the city, uh, I think we have the role to educate the city and also, because you are paying for your mobile in, uh, bills, probably the service could be included also into your mobile payment. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I use some time which been saved. <laughs> Thank you. Just in time too. 
I, I summarize more or less. Could you bring us the, the, the questions that now it's time to send us a questions? And that's. Sí, sí, sí. Ok, ok. Thank you. Well, it's a common question. Do you, it's, it's real time essential for intelligent transport systems. How you are protecting this data, the, the data? That's the question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's our job. So, if I'm an IT integrator, then uh, I have the knowledge inside the company or I have the best partners. So, don't worry about that because these technologies have been already used in the private sector. Um, of course, it's a big issue, uh, which, uh, which is good to take into consideration. And I'm telling you, we had something in the past, in the last few months in Budapest. So what you have to know that the taxpayers are your biggest voters. And uh, even if you are a company which is serving the citizens, if you do something wrong, then they will punish you so bad. So that's our interest, to, to keep all the data safe. Hmm. You, you want to answer to you or not? No, oh, okay. Another question is, how are you looking now for those people that don't have a smartphone and need to, to have the mobility too? For you, for, for you, for one. Well, I think, I, think, I think city government uh, will have to take care for uh, mobility for all of, all of its citizens. Uh, uh, people who have a car mm -hmm. uh, 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 can uh, provide in their own mobility. <coughs> What we have to do is, is, is not exclude people from a mobility system. So when you are defining or working on mass systems, you'll have to find a way to include uh, also the, the, well, the have-nots, uh, uh, people who uh, don't have their own modes of transport, don't uh, want to use a smartphone. There are also people who don't want to use a smartphone. There are people who don't have a smartphone. And I'm sure that there will be enough uh, possibilities for those people to uh, to be mobile and and and, and um, it's not the end it's not the end of public transport it's mm -hmm. not the end of uh, private owned bikes in Amsterdam so there will still be enough uh, uh, well more than enough possibilities for those people mm -hmm. that's the, the I, I, I'm I agree with this there's always uh, another way to do the thing that is not opposite to the other ways that we do yeah, that's great yeah o another question um, could you further explain how real-time data directly improve mobility for citizens, or are there additional strategies needed? So this is more for, for you, for think, uh, for, yeah. <laughs> okay, so other strategies, um, yeah. But I believe in the, uh, in the power of the people, so you, can really uh, make the difference. So you, if you choose Uber instead of the traditional cabs, then you push the market towards this ecosystem, uh, which just happened in Budapest. Uber was there. They were operating for one year. Then they've been kicked out from the country because, yeah, they didn't pay taxes. So it's a living debate. Uh, we can talk about this. But what, what it made in the city, that now all the cab uh, uh, service providers, they have their application. Before that, they had these really bad call centers, and you never had an answer on that. Now, all, they, uh, all these taxi uh, companies are providing application, and the payment is seamless. You won't be cheated, which is so annoying when you arrive to an airport, and then you pay double or triple price. So I think uh, ask yourself what you can do for this, because based on your decision, uh, this whole ecosystem is going to be pushed to a more um, uh, competitive way. Mm. OK. So uh, just let me add some points uh, regarding the, um, uh, an aspect of mobility, which is security. I think we, we have talked about uh, more, uh, we've been 
focusing more on uh, the economics, etc. But, for example, in this uh, lovely and peaceful city, some some months ago, we had a terrible event, uh, a terrorist attack. So, um, it's not only uh, uh, detecting uh, a car mistakenly uh, going the wrong way; it's it's more than that. So, in the real time, adds some more value. It's, it's not only just, uh, okay, the mobility per se, but some aspects going down into the details of mobility, okay? Like mm -hmm. security. We are all out of time, but I want to thank you, all the panelists, for, for the presentations and the answer for the questions. And, and thank you for all the audience to, to be here. And, and we have to close that session. Thank you very much, everybody. Sure.